times before they finally get a castle that stands up, or maybe robots are doing all of it, or maybe we're all working for Facebook. Or I, I, Who the hell knows? I, I, I mean, I, I think we're all dead. It's, it's like it's science like, fiction. Maybe robots yeah. will feed us after all. Yes. <clears throat> I, I think that it's it's hard to look at, at economics at all in isolation, like b b because a lot of this has to do with questions of morality. Like if if we as a society agreed that like hey. A universal basic income is going to be really expensive. It's going to be hard for all of us to do, but, but. it's it's a moral imperative. Mm -hmm. Then people would do it. Mm -hmm. and, and so, but or, or if you have a technological advance uh, uh, that like the AIs get really good and can do a, t a ton of jobs, well everything will change all of a sudden. Um, but like the birth control pill changed the economics because you did have like women could enter the workforce and still have sex, which they tend to like to do. You, you, you know, so, so, so I'm not, I mean, I so, would so, like so, to so, explain so, that so, sometimes, so, so, yeah. So, so. <laughs> sure, there's something objectionable about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, 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 that women do enjoy sex. So, 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 so it's presumably there. So. It's hard to look at these things in isolation. And, 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 and I think there have always been places where we say, um, the economics of this doesn't make sense to us, but we're carving this out because of religious reasons, or, or because of moral reasons, or because, yeah, that we take care of our old people. That's just what we do. Well, and I think, I think that's a really good point. I think the current system, for instance, we keep going with the current system because it's got moral, because culturally, we've attached a huge amount of moral baggage to yeah. the idea of of uh, free market right. capitalism right. being somehow morally superior to other systems, and to depart from that is to somehow be un-American and terrible and disloyal and bad people. We must and not so, allow a mine shaft gap. Right, and so we keep going and we keep going because of this moral thing that maybe, I don't know if it even did work 400 years ago, but is causing us problems now because it doesn't match the real world situation, but we're not going to let go of it because we're looking at it going, but we have to be good people, so we're going to be good free market capitalists, right? So, so it's a myth-making problem it, as much as it is anything else, bet. right? Well, I'm a big believer in narrative driving like huge amounts of human behavior and beliefs and being just incredibly essentially important, yeah. I, th I think narrative is like a basic mode of human thought. We sort of process the whole world that way. But that's my... Well, the, the, uh, Abraham Lincoln once said, he, when he met Harriet Beecher Stowe, who wrote, wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin. Yeah, Kevin, a little late, he, he started that. <clears throat> exactly, yeah. exactly. Like, yeah. that mobilized people in, in, in a tremendous way. And so, a lot of times it isn't the economists like writing the paper that it makes things make sense. Mm -hmm. It's some scribbler who, who, yeah. who, who makes a really good case that this is what we need to do. We can do it. But uh, Cameron, this stuff is sort of your bread and butter, right? The, the, the like storytelling and market creation. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, no, it was interesting what Anne had said because uh, what was I reading? It's called "You Are Not Dumb Now" or "You Are Dumb." You are less dumb now. Um, and it's a it's a it was a nonfiction book, and it was about uh, the ways that our minds uh, are not have not caught up with the ways that we need to actually interact with the world. We are, we, our minds, consciousness is an act of storytelling. So um, everything that we do and the, the way that we understand consciousness has to do with story. So as young children, when, when, once we can start to formulate stories about ourselves is when we achieve consciousness. So that's why you're like, okay, around ages two or three, you start to get memories and things because your mind starts to create stories. Oh, I went here and then I did this and all of that. Um, and so it's very interesting, this is why stories, this is why we always remember uh, stories, but it's difficult to remember facts and figures. But I can remember you telling me a story, and this is why great speakers will tell you a story and they won't actually like, be like, so you should do X. They will tell you a passionate, involved, emotional story and you'll remember it and that'll drive you. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so I think that that's, uh, that's very interesting. It's absolutely how we, um, how we change the world, literally a story. And stories, that's yeah. why, right, there's a huge thing with banned books and people and, and wanting to people to not speak about things because ideas and stories are contagious. They do change the world, um, which is really powerful and important to storytellers for us to keep in mind. But it's also like negative contagious stories as well. Like Absolutely. Oh my gosh. They're yes. economic memes oh. we keep coming back to. Oh yeah. And like it's one the thing, only way it can possibly be. Mm -hmm. yeah. One thing I find interesting about you know fantasies that don't bother to uh, go into the economics of things is that they'll take as models um, failed economic states. Mm -hmm. Like anything that models the Roman Empire doesn't collapse doesn't make sense because the Roman em emperors didn't know that coining money was different from creating value. 
They just didn't know that. So, like, the Roman Empire had a bunch of, like, false economic memes. Like, if I coin more money, things will be okay, and it's okay to have private debt collectors, and that won't be a problem. And, <laughs> and like, you know, there's New York senators who want to have private debt collection in New York. This is literally how the Roman Empire ended. Like, do you think that, like, fantasy books, like, that aren't thinking about this are kind of perpetuating that kind of idea? Oh, they that? definitely are, because I think, oh, we have, narratives aren't just, like, themselves specifically, but they provide a lot of templates that you use, and so uh, you'll look at a situation, and it'll match a template you've got in the back of your mind, and you'll go, okay, this all matches up, and this corresponds here, without even thinking about it. So when you're putting down just, oh, I'm going to make a fun story about, you know, I'm going to go out and punch orcs or whatever, uh, the narratives you're going to pull up out of the, they're going to be narrative templates that work for you without your thinking about it, and they're going to be those same templates that you're used to every day and never think twice about, and some of them are going to be kind of toxic. Any more questions? Yes. So, um, George Jetson problem, right? So George goes into work, pushes a button, lays down on the couch, says, oh, that was a tough day, and the robots do everything. Really huge problem. Right. So, <laughs> well, so at some point, the, the button doesn't work, and now nobody knows how to fix that, right? But the other thing is, you know, the robots are doing all the work, and nobody, you know, there's people who aren't working, right? We're getting to the point, as you were pointing out, that, you know, it looks like, you know, there's going to be a lot of people who don't have jobs. So in your fiction, I mean, you have these big psychological issues and big issues with you know economies and, and wars and things like that. Is this you know part of what could drive your story? Is okay, all right. So totally you, you, it's yeah. like a large idle class. Or large or? idle class, yeah. Yeah, this is um, or a rejection of technology, right? I mean, honestly, we go back to again. Well, steam engine. We don't want to use a steam engine. What are we going to do with everyone? So there's a rejection of technology that also can happen. We always think progress is a straight line, right? We think, oh, in the future, That's and in fact, right, model. yeah, there's yeah. a very different way that things could go, and there's a rejection of, you know, let's keep this technology and this one, but no, let's get rid of that one because we need to have people doing something. And um, even as you're rejecting technology, you can end up in different sorts of means that require more or less work, right? So in Colombia, before the rise of Western <coughs> agriculture, they it took about, if you were using traditional grove farming techniques, so you have like a, you know, enormous trees to cast shade, so you're not getting too many weeds, and then you're growing squash and stuff, it took about three hours of work to produce enough, a day, to produce enough calories to feed a family for a day. So that's, you know, you want to talk about a dominant idle class. This is everybody that you ever knew doing basically three hours of work a day, and that was how you lived. That's not bad. Which is not pretty bad. <laughs> not too bad, right? I mean, you hang out. Human beings are fantastic at amusing themselves. Um, and on, on the other extreme, you have, like, Ian Banks' culture books, which is sort of assume that we win against scarcity. It's, the how of it is hand-waved a little bit, and there are nanites and enormous artificial intelligences involved. But then, okay, so what do people do with their time? And the answer is... Lots of stuff. Whatever they want. Yeah, whatever they, they want. They yeah. want books. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. That, was, that ties into uh, one of the things I've read is that, for instance, before agriculture became a thing at all, right, you're spending maybe a few hours a day, like you say, to feed yourself. Uh, agriculture comes in and you look at the remains of people who lived in the early agricultural societies, their nutritional state just absolutely plummets. They were miserable. They were starving to death. Why were they were not better off? They were doing more work. What made them do that, right? There was something about that, and yet we're still kind of living in that model where we're doing huge amounts of work. Where, why aren't we just working three hours a day growing squash? And then, how did how did that happen, right? And there are books that speculate about answers to that question, like the the uh, James S. A. Corey novels. Uh, the way Earth works is that you know there's a universal doll. Um, but after, at a certain point in your life, you spend a year doing a job, and you know, if you succeed in life and aren't fired, you get to work, and then you can buy things that give you prestige. And you know, a lot of people want to do that. Um, there's a book coming out uh, this summer from Tor called uh, "To Like the Lightning," which has a kind of nicer uh, take on that, which uh, is by Ava Palmer, a friend of mine, very good book. Um, I didn't edit it, so. Um, uh, where, like, there's, you know, there, there's been a, a mostly a win against scarcity, so, like, the, there's a class of people called vocateurs 
who are drawn to work mm. and they're like you know really highly praised by everyone and also they're all of the characters in the book because no one who's not a vocator is going to do anything in the book so we only see them I love that work is a kink yeah it's all <laughs> sort of, right? like, I mean and you can see that right now like there's people who like you know at the end of the work week, they stop, and people who end of the work week, they keep going. Mm -hmm. There's yeah. definitely some professions where, at this point, it's like a power exchange relationship with mm -hmm. your profession. Like if if I edited twenty more hours a week, I would definitely advance faster. <laughs> uh, but I died. <laughs> Don't <laughs> die, Carl. Like I know. I put out less books if I died. Um, there, there have been some, some experiments over the last thirty or forty years with basic income, in very particular pocket in Canada and so on. Amsterdam's doing it now. I think. Yes, um, and one of the findings that not not specifically in one place, but it was precisely that. You know, people will, will, will transcend what their situation is and they will find meaningful meaningful expressions for their yeah. Well and that's one of the things I find super interesting is one of the really common narratives in our culture is if you give people money, well then nobody will do anything. They won't work and they'll just be lazy and then we'll just be it's giving them a handout. Yeah. Except my experience sure is, if you sh if you put somebody and you say you don't have anything to do now for the next six so months, crazy. they're going to lose their minds. Yeah. I think most people would want to find some kind of work to do. If, when I was staying home with my kids, I started I started writing because I was like I have to do something. And writing is is not trivial work actually. I mean, it seems like it when you're just sitting there, but it's not. And I had to do something. And I think that's far more common. I think it's really interesting how common that narrative is preventing you know, the idea of going to a system where you're not, you have, have, don't have to do all this wage work to survive, but I think way more people would work voluntarily yeah. than and going, people realize. And going back to the kind of, like, toxic narrative thing, like, that idea that, like, oh, if you give people money, they'll, for, they'll like, spend it immediately was, like, dominating, like, foreign aid for many years. Mm -hmm. And people were like, well, let's test this. And, you know, they, mm -hmm. you, you give, like, a very poor woman in India some money, she'll buy a bicycle, and she'll start a small business, yeah. mm -hmm. or something like that. And, and the kids if will you be give much them, better if you give them the some food, they'll eat it. Yeah. Or it'll get <laughs> stolen or something, right? Like, so well, it gets stolen, and then warlords sell it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you've empowered warlords. Well, you, you're always empowering warlords. Oh, no. That's just how it goes. <laughs> Maybe you're all well. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse you, sir. I provide the small value. <laughs> So we have time for one short question. Mm. Oh, come on. Yeah. There's a person with a question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, briefly, who has done this well, particularly well, in fiction up to this point? Like, if you, if you wanted to put out a pamphlet of the best works for, best science fiction and fantasy works as rated by their economics, it, Trader Bear Cormorant. Yeah, I, I haven't read it, but that's what I've That's what everybody's been talking about. Yeah. Trader Bear Cormorant by Seth Dickinson. Probably uh, The Dagger and the Coin. Oh, yeah, books by uh, Daniel Abraham. Probably yeah. Foundations. <laughs> kind of invented <laughs> by old school. thinking yeah. about a teacher. Yeah. One, of, one of my favorites, although this isn't one of the books we're mostly about, is there's a character in uh, the Malazan Book of the Fallen mm -hmm. named Tate Hall Bedict, who's like, no, I'm pretty pissed off at the way the world works, uh, so I'm going to like secretly hoard a bunch of money and then drop it in the ocean and topple this empire, <laughs> and then show up as the new emperor and be like, yes, I'm going to change things. <laughs> um, it's great. He literally throws a bunch of money in the ocean. That's awesome. Have gold, so it all goes away. There's just some plot about that in, in G. Oh, wait, no, it's actually the opposite. He, like, he, he gets a bunch of money and then drops it on the market. So oh, nothing right, okay. against it. Oh, wham, yeah. Um, I, this is not exactly the answer to this question, but I really like Ursula Le Guin's Hainish books. Um, and stories for exactly this reason. She is investigating a broad range of societies um, with radically different anthropological and economic sort of uh, as an ancillary category um, conditions uh, very seriously. And some of the books are about characters in these situations and some of the books and stories are just setting out the preconditions, but she does it brilliantly, I think. I thought for sure you are going to say The Dispossessed. No. Well, that would be in that's contained in that set. Yeah. Yeah. You had a question? Yeah. I had a comment. So, um, well, we've only got like five minutes. Left. Go two minutes for a comment. <laughs> it was the uh, it was more about the unpaid labor that because um, I'm a stay at home mom, mm -hmm. um, working to be a writer, but I'm but my labor is I'm a stay at home mom, but on paper I'm unemployed. Exactly, mm -hmm. it's not classed as work. It's ter it's work. But it's hard work, and it's not counted as work. I have an eight month old now. I have a five year old, and I also have an eight month old. I've had like I get like eight hours off a month, 
<laughs> most days. But, you know, and that's when you get to shower by yourself, right? But it's when you get into the the economic, like the the minimum income, is the you know, are you paying for you know where people like well, you're paying people not to work. Well, no, you're not paying me not to work. You know, a minimum income wouldn't be paying me not to work. It's paying me for the three meals a day I put in the next generation. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, of oh, the next generation of taxpayers. Yes. Yeah. Someone else will raise them. <laughs> Where are the entrepreneurs going to come from? Yeah, so you're absolutely <laughs> right. What you call work is a really important factor in it, and it's really interesting what doesn't get called work. And, yeah. if people, if and it's just, essential. If yeah. people just literally drop that directly into like daycare expenses, that's, right. that's yes. paying people to then do some other kind of work. Mm -hmm. Well, and like in the 40s, they had drop in um, centers because yeah. they wanted the women to go to work in the factories and they knew they had to do something with the kids. And, um, and it actually like improved some of the economics because you could just, if you wanted to work, you had a safe place for your kids. Mm -hmm. but, sorry, I'll. No, it's stop geeking now. Yeah. And, well, yeah, and then we get into this question of like the valuation of work, right? I mean, as as artists, you you were talking about writing as work, and like yeah, it's and, work. And so on the one hand, we create things as work to value them. On the other hand, like that's also a, a sort of second order consequence of living in a market economy, right? Nothing has value unless we can call it work, which strikes me as a little fucked up. <laughs> but you know. That's why we write fiction. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think one of the interesting things about writing is how um, remarkably successful it's been at keeping an art patronized after patron stuff really being a thing. Mm. Because, like, you know, basically the way Macmillan works is that all of your salaries are paid by Bill O'Reilly's books about killing Jesus or whatever. <laughs> but, and, but that you money, steal his money. <laughs> that money lets you do so many other things and work on so many projects that you may, maybe aren't going to turn around money right away. We can pay advances, we can work on people who might be the artists of the future, and we'll come up with really great ideas. You don't see that in ballet, you don't see that in sculpture, you don't see that with oil painting. Um, so, you know, there are, like, there are some interesting models for how you can get things turned into like valued work. It's, it's, really it's, it's been interesting for me to, to travel to places like France, and there are far fewer writers because the jobs are so good, and, and like the benefits are so good that nobody wants to take the risk but to, 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 to like, you know, try to do this for five or ten years out of college. You know, and, and so I, I meet very few professionals in France. But also in France, Every book has the same cover and released on the same day. So there's a lot of things weird about some of well, well, yeah. the, 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 the There are a lot of things weird about some We are from France. <laughs> Just remember, change is not optional. Yeah. That's very this, true. The present path is unsustainable. Okay, thank you for joining us.